Um, uh, sorry to point out the obvious, but it's empty. <laughs> things that are empty, you can put things in them, as you discover when you're three, three or four years old. So we've been putting atoms and gases and molecules, vapors, liquids, particles, you can, anything you want. You, as long as it's small enough, you can put it in. Um, and that's interesting. Put it in there with the light. Uh, you have huge path lengths um, at 1.5 microns. The very best hollow core allows you to travel three kilometers. Uh, that's the 3 dB absorption length. Um, so that, that's a nice thing. And all these different characteristics make this a, an absolutely wonderful, ideal, almost uh, dream. It's almost like a dream working with it uh, if you want to do nonlinear objects and gases. Because you, can, you, 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 can, you have your nonlinearity provided by the gas or whatever you put in. You have a huge path length. And an added plus, of course, of the fiber structure is that one can design the dispersion. One has control over the group velocity dispersion profile, how that changes with wavelength, which is absolutely critical in, in, in a lot of, of nonlinear optics um, contexts. And you have no loss, so you can go a long distance and keep the dispersion very well controlled. And you have a very nice uh, single mode intensity profile. The area of that, uh, that mode is, can, be, can be small. Um, uh, so we get a lot of intensity for a given power. So it has all the advantages we want. Um, we can tune it at nonlinearity, we get long path lengths and so on. So let's have a look at a couple of recent uh, results. Um, the first one is the most recent from my group. The second one is uh, on a continuing uh, investigation that I, sta I started while I was at the University of Bath with my postdoc, uh, Fede Ben Abid who now has his own group in Bath, and is also working on this topic. And the third one has to do with putting things into the core, putting matter into the hollow core, small particles, and driving them along using light. So deep UV generation, uh, it's, it's a reasonably large team. These are the people working on uh, this topic of, of um, UV or X-ray or high harmonic generation in uh, investigating the use of these fibers in that, in that context. I'd like particularly to mention uh, John Travers and uh, Nicola Jolie, who are really leading this team um, of students and uh, PhD students. Let me jump now to a structure that you haven't seen yet. This, um, this SEM picture is of what we call a Kagome lattice um, uh, fiber. It has, it has a hollow core in the center here, and the, uh, the outside, I think you may detect, if, if you're tuned into the structure correctly, that looks very much like a Star of David. That's exactly what it's supposed to be. It's slightly distorted because we didn't manage to make it terribly accurately. Well, that's always what happens when you make these things. They get slightly distorted. But if you take a Star of David and stack it, you get a Kagome lattice. Um, the Kagome lattice originated, I think, in, in, uh, in Kyoto in Japan. It's a basket weaving uh, pattern. <coughs> now, this particular type of holocore fiber doesn't, <coughs> doesn't actually confine light using, excuse me, <coughs> doesn't actually confine light using a photonic band gap effect, which is sort of interesting. It confines light by our good old friend, the stop band, which existed for decades before the photonic band gap came along. Turns out there are several stop bands which are incomplete. In the, in the structure because of the overlapping sets of parallel uh, uh, webs of glass. Um, and and it, it, this particular fiber provides quite good guidance. The loss is fairly high. But the nice thing about it in terms of experiments is that, you, that the dispersion is actually very low, as I'll show you in a minute. You can work out the refractive index of the guided mode in the core of this fiber uh, from a very simple uh, uh, approach where we say that the transverse wave vector of the, of the mode in the core has to have a value which is quantized by the, determined by the diameter of the core. That has to be the right value. And having established that value, you can then, you can then work out the refractive index of the guided mode. This will depend on the refractive index in the core itself, which we're going to put argon gas in. So you need to put the index of argon gas in there to the power of two, minus a, a term which includes the wavelength of the light, the radius of the core, and the zero of a Bessel function. Okay, it's a very simple expression. Uh, you can look up in tables, you can look up in papers what the refractive index of the argon is, and we end up with this expression, uh, approximately, which contains uh, a, a term which depends on wavelength. That's the dispersion of the argon gas. Uh, thank you very much. That's super. Yes, I've had a bit of a cold recently. No, I've had the mother of all colds, actually, recently. <laughs> Um, anyway, so, so this, this term represents what the argon does, and you notice very nice that we can change the pressure of the argon gas and change the dispersion. 
um, uh, and you work it all out. Uh, this this this, like term, this this expression actually works rather well to describe the dispersion of the of the gas. So it's slowly falling down, and we turn it up a little bit. Um, This turns out that you, can, you have a pressure-dependent group velocity dispersion if you put argon gas into the, into the hollow core. And here are some calculations based on that expression I just showed you. The empty fiber, evacuated, nothing in it, would have a dispersion. And this is picoseconds per kilometer. These are really small values, 1.5 to minus 0.5. Okay. If we add uh, 2.5 bar, 2.5 at 2.5 atmospheres of argon, we can shift the dispersion to the blue curve, and uh, the higher pressures it moves, moves up and moves up. These are very delicate adjustments to the dispersion profile. This is not a massive change in dispersion. It's, it's just what you want. You've got a knob, you can turn up and down. The lever, you can push up and down and change the dispersion profile as you wish without having to change any of your optics. Okay, so that's, that's what we've been using in these experiments. Uh, we were interested initially in third harmonic generation in the gas. Uh, we looked at that. I'm not going to talk about that today because the efficiencies were pathetic. Um, but playing with the setup and playing with the pressure, playing with the pulse energy, um, uh, we, we observed something that we couldn't initially explain. We observed the generation of deep ultraviolet uh, short pulses in the deep ultraviolet, which are tunable, and so on. And here's the setup. Um, we take standard pulses from a tie sapphire, amplified tie sapphire um, oscillator, 800 nanometers, 30 femtosecond duration, energies in the one microjoule range, so not, not very, not, not hugely huge amounts of energy. The fiber itself is only 20 centimeters long. This Kagome structure is filled with gas, um, in a rather simple way, with gas cells and connected to a gas to an organ um, regulator, gas regulator. Afterwards, we have, after the, the output of the fiber, we have all sorts of diagnostics, spectrometers, CCD cameras for checking what kind of mode we have, and also a, a, filter, a filtering system of lots of mirrors for extracting the deep ultraviolet light to see how much energy there is in the ultraviolet. That's the setup. What we saw that really surprised us, actually, is uh, that under the right conditions of pressure and pulse energy, we saw very strong... Uh, ultraviolet light coming out of the fire, quite dramatic, you could see it lighting up. Um, in this particular measurement, it's centered around 260, which is not, not at the third harmonic of, uh, of the TISAF. This is not, not a third, third harmonic process. And in particular, it's not a third harmonic process because the light actually is generated in the fundamental mode of the core. That, that is a measurement of the profile, the intensity profile of the ultraviolet light. If you wanted to get third harmonic generation, the only way you can get it with phase matching is to a higher order mode in the ultraviolet, which is lots and lots of lobes and there's not much use. Unless you like pretty patterns, it's not awfully useful for, for applications. So this really excited us. that we, we had ultraviolet light in a fundamental mode, and potentially we could focus that to a tiny spot. And of course, with all the knobs and levers we have to pull and push, we can change the energy of the pulse, we can change the pressure, and we wanted to see what happened if we did that. It turned out we were able to tune the wavelength of that burst of ultraviolet light. We were able to tune it by changing the pressure from, from 0 to 10 bar. That's what we had in the system. And you can see we were able to tune the, the wavelength from around 200 nanometers, in this case, up, up to about uh, 260 or so. Um, and the light remaining in the nice fundamental mode. We could also change the pulse energy at constant pressure. <laughs> The, the energy of the pulse on the left-hand side was one microjoule. On the right-hand side, we're keeping the pressure constant at 9.9 .9 bar and changing the pulse energy. And you can see here that we can tune the wavelength of that burst of ultraviolet light, that short ultraviolet pulse, uh, down to around 260 in this particular case. It's just a couple of examples of what we can do. <coughs> so we have a system where we have wavelength tunable deep ultraviolet light from around 200 nanometers to 350 nanometers. Um, with the setup, we were able to measure the efficiency of conversion to the deep ultraviolet, and this also surprised us. So we could see it was very bright in the lab, um, but until you measure it, you're not quite sure what you're seeing. Uh, but very careful measurements uh, convinced us, and we've been through this many times, that, that, that we're getting about up to, approaching 10% conversion efficiency from, the, from the, the 800 nanometer pulses to the ultraviolet pulses, which, uh, which is uh, quite, quite remarkable. It makes it really a very useful source. It's tunable, short pulses of ultraviolet light, and, it, and uh, also it comes out of a, well, let me go through the advantages of it later. Um, let me just show, show you a short video of how this looks. 
That's the fiber stretched across between two, um, two uh, pressure cells. It's filled with argon. You can see it's not kept.